You're listening to the Youth Pick Podcast on KHC Network. Find us on Facebook at Decibel UNG Radio and find us on Twitter at Decibel UNG. If you like this episode, please leave a like and comment on our iTunes page at KHC Network. And now for the podcast. Hey guys, how was the party? It was really fun. Aces. <laughs> he's wearing a woman's sweater and he's drunk. Well, he didn't drive drunk and he's home before curfew, so. That's what I thought we got. Really? Yeah, we're good parents. Yeah, we're good. All right. Fake young woman. Good morning, Creekwood Hog. My name's Simon. For the most part, my life is totally normal. I have a family that I actually like, and there's my friends. We do everything friends do. We drink way too much diced coffee. We walk gorging on carbs. So, I'm just like you, except I have one huge ass secret. Hey! I like your your boots! I said I like your your boots! Goodbye! Nobody knows I'm gay. (sighs) Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Youth Critic Podcast. I'm your host, Kel Smith. Joining me today. Uh, on the podcast is we have Matthew St. Clair, who has done so many things. Matthew, why don't you say hi and tell everyone where you've been? Oh, hey, everybody. Um, well, since, since I was on your last episode uh, where we discussed Call Me By Your Name and I, Tanya, I've been continuing my continuing the uh, Film School podcast, which is a, which I'm currently co-hosting with my good friend Daniel Bayer. We have, we have some uh, discussed some pretty good stuff, so if you, you, you should be sure to check that check that out as well. Nice. And today we are going to be looking at the movie Love Simon, the new LGBTQ film from Greg Berlanti, and it's a kind of a special movie. And while uh, movie, well. Films, in, films about films with you know LGBTQ perspectives and themes and characters have existed since you know forever. This is the fir- This is, by my knowledge, the first studio, studio broad populist gay film with a gay protagonist. Yeah, and, and I can honestly say. It's really good, and it's been a long time coming, and I and I just can't, and I'm kind of thrilled by it. I am over the moon excited that this is that this movie now exists, and I'm so happy. And not to give, not to undermine uh, movies like Moonlight, Bro- Brokeback Mountain, or um, Call Me by Your Name, but it's great that this film kind of exists in the zeitgeist. And my opinion on the movie is it's great to have this movie because now, now this, now the community does not have to travel, you know, to like a metropolitan area to see, uh, to see a movie representing them. And I think that's so important. And I say all this while, my movie, the- my local movie theater, and the local and the other local movie theater, twenty minutes up the road, still does not have "Call Me by Your Name" or "Love Love Simon." Uh. Yeah, but progress, progress is being made. And <laughs> but with that, so, but on that note, uh, Matt, I'm going to let you take it over. What did you think of "Love Simon"? I loved it. I loved it. 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 I thought it was a warm, sentimental crowd pleaser that goes too sentimental at times towards the end. But yeah, I still found it to be a very winning film watching experience. For well, and for me, the reason why I found this so impactful is that you just buy you buy the character of Simon Spire. You just buy his, you know, you buy his, you know, conflict, you buy everything about it. Like, there's nothing in this movie 
without getting to not spoilers, and we'll get into spoilers in a little bit, there's nothing in the movie where it runs on it runs on typical stereotypes of what we would think would happen in this kind of movie. Nor does it, you know, nor does it, you know, uh, end in a tragedy. And I think that's kind of important and very much you kind of want to see this. You you want to see this kind of movie, and you want to, and you feel for the characters, and you feel for, and you're with the story, you know, even through it's like you said, very sentimental moment, sentimental moments at the end. You're just with it. It's and there are some things that you know in the movie that are kind of like that that will kind of that will kind of raise that will raise questions, but it's still like this is kind of. But all I can say is this is an incredible or it's an incredible it's a really good story about this one character and we see his you know jer- we see his you know struggle and we see him you know deal you know dealing with his own you know coming out uh sexu- coming out with with his sexuality and it completely works on er- on a lot of on a narrative level and 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 I will agree to an extent that the film does follow a very standard procedural structure. Like, yes, the character has at the end of the the second act, basically, you know, he you know he valleys and then he and then he rises and peaks till the end of the movie, and and then the climax happens, and it's a be- and it's a beautiful ending. <laughs> Yeah. But, but yeah, but the thing for me that that makes the movie work so well is that it's from the perspective, and you're from, and you're in his POV, much like black, much like how Black Panther was. You know, you're in, you're in this perspective, you're in this POV, you're in this kind of world that T'Challa was is living in. So for me, I feel like the reason why this works so well is because you buy into, you buy into most of what Simon Spire is going through and you buy into it very well. And you, and on top of that, it's, it's a warm, it's like a warm slice of apple pie. It's like a, you, it's this, it's, you feel good eating it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. Um, so, uh, Matt, do you have any more non-spoilery th- thoughts? Well, the, I thought the performances across the board were amazing. Even even Tony Tony Hale was a scene stealer as the the incredibly overbearing vice principal who always tries to take everybody's cell phones. Yeah, I really like Tony Hale in this, uh, and I liked the drama teacher. Uh, Mrs. Yeah, I Albright. forgot her name. I'm tr- trying to de. Oh, I'm I'll look it up. I am be it. Uh, Natasha Rothwell. Oh, Natasha Rothwell. Yeah. Natasha she, Rothwell. She, she was amazing as well. Every line she said just made me laugh. Like it. 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 it, it I laughed through every bit of you know this movie every line that she had and not only did I laugh at there is truth to it. She basically is, you know, the person delivering the, you know, delivering the truth while also delivering, you know, while also delivering the laughs. It's an incredible breakout performance. Right. And of course there is the amazing Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner. She should, you know, the, this in, Juno and men, women, and children. Like she has been in movies where she just she makes you want to cry. She makes you just, or she get, or she has the moment in those movies where you just are devastated. Yeah. Or and you know, and not and 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 this moment it's already and this moment is pretty much all over. Not already kind of sort of been spoiled. But she does get her Michael Stolberg moment in this movie. 
and she gets to you know have this heart to heart moment with Simon and that speech that like little one paragraph monologue she heart to heart monologue she has with Simon is both heartbreaking but the thing that the the thing that all you know all coming out teens need to hear or they should hear yeah it's just it's an and of course you know and everyone on, across the board brought their a game everyone across the board i uh, you had i mean Josh Demel came in everyone gave a very good performance yep. everyone i don't think there was a weak link i don't know not not even uh Logan Miller who plays Simon's bully he is the yeah the antagonist of the movie, or as I kind of quoted in my review for SoCal Thrills, the adorable misogynist. Ah, uh. he just yeah. I mean, he's every, even when he's playing a terrible character, he's still giving a committed performance, and he's still working overtime to want to lie. You want to to you know play this character that is you know, the good guy, but he's not. Oh, he's not. He's definitely so, not. No, he's not. I mean, and if there was one fault in the movie is that the film arguably tries to, doesn't arguably try to redeem him towards the end, but I think the film play, I think the film balances how they treat Martin in this movie because I think it's a very hard balance because so many people have fallen in love with this kind of character the kind of um this you know this character they've fallen in love with characters like Martin in other high school movies and to see it kind of be the literal antagonist of the movie it's it's a really interesting balance because they want so much for to show the character as he is, but the character itself is optimistic, even though it's even though he's completely wrongheaded. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, got any more thoughts before we, you know, move on to the segments and then spoiler section? Well, I would. I will say that in spite of the Mac. The uh, tired machinations within the screenplay. It's still, it's still a rec- one I would recommend seeing. One reason because of its, because of its cultural importance, and also because of the quality of the film itself. So go. I would say go and. I would say go. Go to your nearest theater and check it out. Whether it's on a matinee showing or bargain, bargain Tuesday or even a. 10 o'clock showing. Go go see it. It's it's amazing. It is and al- so and, and also it's got an it's got an amazing song in the soundtrack from the instantly iconic Troy Sivan. Oh, we got to talk about we got to talk about that all right, when we get back because yeah. The soundtrack is so important in the not just that the song Strawberry and Cigarettes, but uh the song but the whole soundtrack of the movie is we have to talk about it yeah. but but before we you know get into the soundtrack and the spoilers let's let's say hey to our other guest hosts on the show uh mike mike messina and Kaylin. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Youth Critic Podcast. I'm here with Mike Messina. Hey, everyone. How's it going? And we're talking about Love, Simon. And so, Mike, what did you think of Love, Simon? Uh, I absolutely loved it. I am uh, very, very happy with it. Um, I I just, the whole time, uh, I was just feeling all of the emotions. Uh, it's a very emotional movie. Um and the way all of the characters are and how they react to certain things and just the high school life in general, um, all of it I just thought was really well done. Uh, I was just a, a really, really big fan of it overall. 
Um, and yeah, I just, I really, really, really like it. I love this movie. This, I saw this movie, uh, back in January and I thought it, wow. even then I was like, uh, I didn't, I didn't get to tell Matt this, but the day that I saw Love, Simon and the reason why I was very nervous about doing a lot of reviews before I saw it again, uh, was because I saw it the, the, hour before i went to saw it my grandfather had died Mm. or my grandfather i found out my grandfather died and i was so i was already a little emotional and throughout the second half of the movie i pretty much ugly cried through the whole second half because it really just struck a nerve it Mm -hmm. struck a nerve in me because uh the those are because you know the because it just captured that high school experience so well. And right. it captured the experience that Simon was going through so well. Mm-hmm. And you, d- and there are just things in my, in that movie that relate to, it just relates to my life in a way that I felt, I, it, it felt tethered. And then of course, you know, uh, and then of course, you know, I don't know what scenes got you the most, but the scene with Josh, the heart to heart with Josh Demel and Nick Robinson just it broke it literally broke me for about ten or fifteen minutes. Uh, that's definitely a really really good scene. Um, even just the uh, expressions on the faces of Nick Robinson and Josh Jamal uh, during that scene, um, they just did a really really good job together. I really bought them as father and son. Um, also, uh, the one-on-one scene with Nick Robinson and Jennifer Garner, I thought was really well done. Uh, I, I, I just really bought them as a family. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I really like that they had a focus on the family stuff as, as well as the friend stuff. Because, you know, a lot of time um, that could be kind of pushed over. But I, I think that was important that they had that featured heavily in the film as well. Um, and I, I really, I really liked all of the, you know, very, I, I, I almost want to say quiet scenes where it's just a one-on-one uh, interaction between normally Simon and someone else, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I really liked all of the relationships he has. Um, they all were, a little different and it was it, it just added a, a, a really good variety to the movie like seeing all the different relationships in his life between his friends and his family yeah it's that's what i kind of liked about the relationships not just with the family but the friends they all mm-hmm. felt distinct mm-hmm. they all felt Distinct and the characters themselves felt like they had goals and journeys. They all felt like they had something going on as well, you know, on top of, you know, on top of what Simon Spire is doing. So it felt like, so it just fit. So I, that's what I loved about the movie. It, Cause most movies are, are a lot of teen films that are kind of just average and whatnot. And you may or may not disagree. They have characters that are just kind of there to be the comedic relief or, right just to kind of, you know, or they're kind of just there for the purpose of, of a funny scene or a, a sad scene. They're kind of just there to fill a purpose. Whereas each character had their moment and each character had their purpose. Like for me, I felt like the, the scenes with, you know, Simon and Leah really mm-hmm. were impactful because Leah is her own character as well. She mm-hmm. also felt, she also was fought, having feelings for Simon at, you know, at many points. And mm-hmm. of course, you know, of course, when she finds out that, you know, Simon is gay, he had, you know, she has to kind of live with, she has to confront it and live with it and let allow, you know, and have, and tell Simon about it. She has to confront those. Mm-hmm. And those moments are perfect. And also what worked for me was how bathos was used. Do you know what the term is? Pathos? Bathos, yeah. Bathos. No, bathos. 
B A B A T H O S. Wait, what? I don't think I know bathos. I know pathos. What's bathos? Bathos is where you have an emotional moment that is then kind of undercut with a funny moment or kind okay. of ends. And it happens a lot in Marvel movies. It happens. Mm-hmm. Especially right. in like uh, in Ant Man when uh, um, when Hank Pym is telling uh, his daughter about his mother or his, mm-hmm. or her mother, mm-hmm. and and then Paul Rudd makes a funny joke to kind of cut the scene, cut the tension. Yeah, it, it's not all. It's never. It's not really always used that well because usually it's just better to kind of invest in the moment. It, but the way Love Simon handles, you know, Bathos is, it really doesn't undercut any of the tension, and and you kind of do need a little bit of humor at the end of each like heart to heart or emotional scene, because it just you are just you know both devastated or you have you're just crying, so you need a little bit of a pick me up just to get through the next scenes. Right. So. Yeah. Agreed. I, yeah. Yeah. I. I. I um. I, I remember actually I uh, texted you after I saw it um, or I think where you you told me to text you what my thoughts and yes I said that I, I do I really do I think it's in in the top three uh, YA adaptations like that we've we've received in like the last five years um, like I think it's right there with the perks of being a wallflower and the vault our stars uh, I think those three like those two and then this one are really right there at the top of like how good YA adaptations can be. Um, and like it, it's, you know, I, I, as someone who, you know, actually like I'm currently writing a YA novel at the moment and I've, I've read so, so many, like it, it's my favorite genre to read and that's why I'm writing one. Um, <laughs> And I love seeing them adapted. And it just shows, like, you know, YA novels, like, they have such a huge fan following. Like, this the, this one had a huge fan following going into it, um, you know. Particularly our like, generation. Right, exactly, exactly. And, you know, you go to The Fallen Our Stars and John Green's novels. You know, John Green's my favorite author. You know, his, all of John's novels have a huge following. And, you know, the his stuff has been adapted really well. Um, and then, you know, with this being adapted really well and the perks of being wallflower, um, you know, the author actually directed the film, which is awesome. And what I hope to do someday with mine, but, um, but it, it just shows like, you know, these, all these books, like they have a huge following for a reason, you know, they're really great. And that's something people could connect to when they're reading these books, they really, really connect with it. And when it's done so well on screen, it's awesome because you get to either, if you've read the book, you get to connect with it in this amazing way all over again in a different way. Or, you know, if you haven't read the book, um, just connect with it like you do reading these books, um, but just on screen. So that's why, you know, sometimes it's disappointing when some of the YA novels, they aren't given the care like these are. Um, but there are quite a few that are done really well, like the ones that I, I mentioned, um, for example. And yeah, I, I really think that... Um, Greg Berlanti was a great choice to direct this. You know, he's he's behind all the CW shows. Um, all the good ones. Well, all the good CW shows. <laughs> uh, like, you know, as far as like DC TV goes. And those are so filled with emotion. And um, and, it, and those are all handled just really well. And this needed someone who could handle lots of different emotions between a lot of different characters. And that's like what the CW shows do. They have like a, a, a big collection of characters and there's always emotions running high. And especially in the superhero shows, because you deal with that along, like, like, especially take the flash, for example, you have all these characters, so many things like running. <laughs> I was going to say so many things running around. I wasn't no pun intended, was, right? yeah, no pun intended. And meanwhile, Barry is also having to deal with being actually the flash. But so you throw that into Simon, um, you know, he's dealing with his secret and not ready, ready exactly to come out with it yet. And then also dealing with all the emotions of all of his friends and everything else. So I think it was just a really good fit. It was. And it's also from the writers of This Is Us or like one of the writing teams that work on the show. 
Right. I, I'm actually, fun fact, I just finished season one of This Is Us uh, this morning. Um, mm-hmm. And I, uh, I, I'm on to season, I'm on to uh, the second episode of season two. I watched like three or so episodes this morning. I love This Is Us. It's so well written. I need to watch it. Like my dad, my mom and dad watch it and nice. they're telling me it's great. And then our, our friend Patrick keeps telling me it's great. And I'm just like, I don't know if I can take uh, all the emotions that happen oh. in that show. It's, it's all of the feels you could possibly imagine. Like, but, but it's just so well, it, it's just, the writing is just perfect. And the, the performances, um, especially not to go too much into a segue or a segment about this, uh, but just to give it its props, uh, like Sterling, Sterling K Brown, his performance in the show, it, like it just leaves you breathless. Um, and uh, like um, Milo Ventimiglia, he's amazing. Um, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. I saw some of the uh, Super Bowl episode. Oh, okay. Cause see, I, was, see, I, haven't, I haven't seen that one yet because that's later in the season uh-huh. too. So I don't even, I don't know what's up with that one. Yeah. And it's um, uh, not to spoil it, but it's really <laughs> emotional. <laughs> it really is like spoiler. <laughs> Every episode of This Is Us is emotional. <laughs> it's well, it's more emotional than I would than I thought it would be. Okay, yeah. I don't want to spoil it, but it's really right. it. Right. It actually almost convinced me to watch the show because yeah, you really should. You really, really should. Um, I've been breezing through it. I, I was kind of like, I, I've been putting it off just because I, you know, as the weeks go by, as time works, you just. Uh, kind of you know you have so much to catch up on and that's kind of a lot of people's reasons not to catch up on a show because like oh i got so much to watch but i watched it so quick i watched all of this in like five days or something nice i yeah. still need to re i still need to catch up on riverdale season two so yeah you, yeah you need to do that need to yeah do. i know i need to i i love riverdale season one but i need to catch up on season two um gotta but, do it yeah, but yeah, I I thought this was a gr- and I thought this was a great team that they yeah. got together. Normally, you would get um, uh, correct me if I'm is this the right team? Scott Neustrader and Michael Weber. You would get them to write the team. Well, story. yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, they're they are great, right? Like they are. They, they, are. they are arguably my favorite screenwriters. Like just straight up screen, just straight up favorite screenwriters, just because mm-hmm. they they um. I, and of course, they're known for adapting John Green's novels, of course. And um, they they actually were uh, they actually wrote the script for Looking for Alaska, uh, John's first novel, and that that was supposed to be being made into a film um, like a year and a half ago for the second time, because uh, like ten years ago almost when John's book came out, and he signed over the rights to Paramount to make the film. And then it uh, halted production, and then he had, they they just like didn't even tell him what was going on, basically. And then since then, you know, back when the Fault in Our Stars came out in 2012, and he became like one of the most famous authors out there. Um, and then the film came out and was massively, massively successful. Mm-hmm. That 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 signed over. That was Fox. Fox made the Fault in Our Stars. He didn't sign that over to Paramount, of course, because they screwed him over with with. Uh, um, Looking and, for Alaska's rights, and he gave them Paper Towns, right? And then Paper Towns, he did once again went gave that to Fox. So, and then his new book, uh, which came out in October, Turtles All the Way Down, that uh, already is being made into a movie. His newest book with Fox. So he's literally about to have his newest book that came out like uh, six months ago be made into a movie before his first book still because paramount for some reason they're dropping the ball they hired rebecca thomas who directed electric children and episodes of stranger things to direct looking for alaska she's a really good director um and they had it narrowed down i'm pretty sure to anya taylor joy to play alaska which would have been awesome and he even made a video about it uh saying that like he doesn't know he doesn't they, they won't there there's like not a reason at least, at least a public reason to give. Um, so I don't know why I don't know what's up with that, but Newsetter and Weber—they're great writers, um, especially when it comes to YA stuff. And 
um, movies that focus on relationships and whatnot. Um, I could have saw them writing this, but uh, it, it was cool that they got, I guess, maybe some different people in there, get some different voices in there. Yeah. Yeah, as far as looking for Alaska goes, um, I guess Paramount they'll just drop it on they'll just drop it on Netflix or sell the international rights to Netflix. Well, they haven't they, they haven't <laughs> they haven't I don't they haven't started production. It was just all pre production. Um, I even know that like John and Rebe- Rebecca Thomas they even went out because it takes place at a boarding school in Alabama, mm-hmm. and they went out there and scouted location and everything, and they like it didn't. <laughs> It just didn't have. I don't know. I don't know. They had they had people cast for it, and it, there's no reason why it hasn't been made yet. I poor, really don't get it. Poor Rebecca Thomas. She she directed the best. She directed the most underrated episode of Stranger Things season two, and <laughs> and, yeah. and she's still like you know trying to get her sci fi movie made and looking for Alaska. I hope that you know. Hopefully, well, hopefully it gets made in general sometime soon. But I hopefully I was very excited about her doing it. So hopefully, they, if they do, ha- like do do the film soon, she still is the director. Yeah, she's still attached. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, th- I brought up Scott Neustrader and Michael Weber because they have been writing YA movies. Like, right. I-, I guess we can count Five Hundred Days of Summer a YA movie. I guess we can. Uh, yeah they're yeah. young how young i how old are they in that movie though 25 ish yeah they're 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 close to our age maybe a little okay. older yeah i, I can't I, I can't remember if they're supposed to be like thir- like how old is joseph gordon levitt and zoe de chanel at that time i don't remember what year did i even come out i don't know uh 2009 wow okay yeah so it's almost a decade old wow oh wow i know we're getting old <laughs> yeah we're getting old here, old, uh, old. but yeah, but they've been writing YA movies and they really got a, you know, broke out in spectacular now. Oh, I love the spectacular now. I love it. love it. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies of the decade. It is. It's, it's also one of my favorite. It's you mentioned top three. That's, that's number one for me. And then love Simon. And then, um, trying to think of another perks of wallflower. Cause right. Uh, spectacular now it came out at a time when i was like graduating high school and uh and about to embark in you know adulthood and so that movie it just means a lot to me and that's why i'll give james ponsel i'll give james ponsel many chances even though the circle was disappointing yeah i don't know what the deal with the circle was to be honest like i i don't like and it had Emma Watson, John Boyega, Tom, Tom Hanks, <laughs> Patton Oswald. I know, man. Like it, like I, I actually didn't see that in theaters. I saw that at home, and uh, like it, it, I, I didn't think it was like I think it had like eight percent or something is what and the rating was. I don't think it was that bad, but it was. I mean, it wasn't good. Uh, it definitely wasn't good. Um, I think maybe just the fact that it had those actors, like that's why it was so watchable. Um, it's weird because when I look at that movie, I just think James Fonsell is really enamored by the technology, but yeah. he's making a movie that's saying that technology is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's a little bit like it's a little, it's a, it's just a little hypocritical because he really loves the world of the circle, but, but for whatever reason, the movie wants to hate on technology. So interesting. It, I can't wait to see what Ponsult does next. So, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan of his. Uh, but it, going back to Love Simon, it, I, Matt and I, uh, we're gonna, or we've talked about, or well, we're gonna talk about it in the show. But we talked about what did you think of the music, of the movie? Oh, it's so good. Uh, I love Bleachers. So um, the fact that they had multiple songs from Bleachers in the movie. Uh, that was great. Um, they they had a roller coaster, and then Alfie's song, which is a song that they actually had Bleachers make for the movie, uh, was an original. I love it. I'm, I'm already in love with that song. I listened to it blaring in the car. Like if you if you guys follow me on on Instagram or Snapchat, you'll probably see me like posting a video every, every few days of me in the car listening to that song. Um, and also, who else is on the song? The 1975 is on the soundtrack. 
Uh, they're one of my favorite bands. Love them. Uh, I think Khalid is on the soundtrack. He's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good soundtrack. I'm a big fan of it. I love the soundtrack of Love, Simon, because it's just needle dropped in there so perfectly in scenes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, when Leah is talking about, like, loving someone that it, it might kill her. I'm par- kind of paraphrasing the line, but it, when they're having the scene after they came home drunk and <laughs> yeah. the song from Amy Shark uh, sink in, it just re- it worked so well. And then if, and then later on, um, Troy Savon, I think that's the, the, uh, his name. Yeah, uh, Troy Savon's in it, yeah. Uh, his song, Strawberry and Cigarettes, comes that's out. Right it's needle dropped in there perfectly when Simon f- thinks that Lyle is blue and it's, you know, it's terrific. It's, you know, the way it's those little needle drops that happen. And then it's accompanied by Nick Rob Simonson's uh, score, which is just like a total, which is a total like homage to John Hughes scores. Uh, or John Hughes mm-hmm. movie scores. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I I really like the school the soundtrack and I can't stop talking about and I can't stop listening to the music. I I think I listened to uh, Strawberry and Cigarettes, Bleachers, Wild Heart, and um, Sink In from Amy Shark. I think I I've listened to it pretty much every day for like the last two or three weeks. I feel you. Yeah, it's a good soundtrack. I definitely I definitely like listening to it a lot. Mm-hmm. So. What else can we say about Love Simon before we move on to move back, move to Caitlin and then back to Matt? Um, well, I just I really like the characters. I thought the characters were handled really well. Every single one of them, uh, I think, got the, the, the attention they deserved. Um, I think that's a big deal. Uh, like you actually cared about all of them. Um, lots of the time you don't focus enough on like the friends or, you know, like you, you're supposed to, but you but you don't know enough, so it doesn't matter. But you actually do get time focused with each of them, so you're like you know that you know what that why they're thinking the way they're th- that they're thinking because a lot of time because they actually just say it out loud to Simon, like he has direct conversations with each of them about it, uh, about just different things going on in their lives or wh- how they feel or whatever's going on. Um, I, and I I just really I really like the friend group. Like I I think that. The friend group is like a friend group that I relate to having in high school. Um, I related to Simon. I feel like I was kind of like the same level of like, like that. That's just like the type of person I feel like I was in high school. Like it, it, he wasn't just under the level. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't like like he, there. There wasn't anything like it. He, it, it, it it felt real, I think is the best way to put it. Like it felt like real, like some, some YA stuff, it, it makes things feel like, oh, you can't really relate to that because this character is acting to the extreme in a certain way um, and with certain highs or certain lows or, or whatever of like what high school life is like. Um, and there are highs and lows, of course, um, and really, really bad stuff and really, really good stuff. Uh, I'm not really necessarily talking about that. I'm more talking about just, uh, just like what what the life like is in general, and, like how you are and the personality type. Um, and I, I think that there's something in him that probably a lot of people can relate to. And just the way he reacts to certain things is very real and very raw. Um, like you, you're like, oh wow, yeah, I totally did that in high school. Like I reacted like, even if it like necessarily wasn't the best way of going about things, he never went about things in a bad way or a negative way or uh, intending to hurt his friends or hurt anyone. Like, you know, he's put in a difficult situation and I feel like a, like a majority of people would react in the way he did, um, to try to help himself and not necessarily hurt his friends, but, you know, manipulate them in a way or uh, manipulate might be a strong word, but. Uh, sway them in a way that would help him um, and also not hurt them because he never intended on that happening. Yeah. Um, and I, I really uh, I really like the casting of everyone. Um, I didn't really think about it until now, but the fact that Keenan Lonsdale's in it um, really makes sense since Greg Berlanti directed it and Keenan Lonsdale is in The Flash. Uh, I didn't really put that together um, until now. I guess that's probably a good reason why he's in the movie. Besides the fact that he's a talented actor, but maybe that connection, I imagine, got him in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And yeah, Catherine, Catherine Langford, she's really good, obviously, of 13 Reasons Why fame. Um, as Leah, she's really great. I, I can imagine, I can see her leading, like being the lead of a YA um, film at some point sometime soon. Um, I mean, you could, I guess you could like argue she's the lead of 13 Reasons Why, but it's all flashbacks. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I think that she's going to get some like, lead roles here pretty soon um and nick robinson i mean he just he's really he really 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 impressed me and carried the film as, as this film's lead just so so well um he really showed how he's feeling well just even just silent scenes um in both uh when, he, when he's feeling like happy and just like uh, one scene that really stuck out to me was when he uh was trying on like different clothes and like looking in the mirror and stuff like that. That really stuck out to me. Just the way he carries himself and whatnot. Uh, I really like that. And um, yeah, we're not. To, are we talking spoilers yet? We're not talking uh, spoilers yet, right? Oh no, we're. I thought we were. We were kind of. We kind of eased into spoilers. We're into, we're into, well, we kind of mentioned uh, uh, Jennifer Gardner and Josh Duhamel, Heart to Heart Saint. So we true. were in. Where we eased it. We kind of eased into spoilers. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, okay. I mean, like, okay, getting into that, uh, his relationship with Martin, like, I, I hate Martin's care. Like, he's such a, like, he's such an ass. Um, and I think this movie, and I actually haven't read the book. It's probably the next book I'm going to read. Um, I, 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 but I, from what I hear, it's pretty much, uh, they adapted it pretty straight up. Um, I, this this character Martin, I, I really like how it tackles like the whole nice guy role. It's like um, really shows that nice guys are kind of like trash. There's a bit, and this is what people need to understand. <laughs> There's a difference between being a nice guy, which is what Martin is, like a quote unquote nice guy, and being a good guy. Like you can yes. be like, like like be a good guy, like a good a good person. Don't be just quote unquote nice, like. No, like you're not supposed to people. You're you don't just get a free card to do whatever you want just because you want people to feel bad for you. Like, like the he like Simon already did feel bad and 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 whatnot, but he was you know blackmailing him from the start, and it was just really messed up and wrong. And uh, it's just a really annoying character. Um, you know when he pays for the last ride on the Ferris wheel, like I guess that's whatever. <laughs> um, like that's cool and all. I don't think we're supposed to forgive him there. I guess it's a little bit of like a okay, cool, but it's still like all right, walk away, ass. Like we haven't forgiven you yet. <laughs> like, well, I mean, the way I look at it is the movie doesn't let him off of it because at the end, at the end of the movie, they're all in the car. To, everyone else is in the car, but Martin. Yeah, yeah. No, he doesn't. This like like that for doing what he should have been doing, supporting him in the first place and being a good person. Like just because you did a whole bunch of, you like you did one good thing after doing a whole bunch of bad stuff. It doesn't like let go of that. Just be a good person. Like that, that's the type of thing, like a nice guy, like again, a nice guy would be looking for is like, Oh, I did all this bad stuff, but because I did this good thing and because, you know, like people should feel bad for me now. Like you're like, I'm off the hook because you're supposed to feel bad for me. No, 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 no. Like, okay start over from here just be a good person and learn from your mistakes um and i think it really showcases that really well um and yeah i like i like you know you mentioned how they're on the car, car together and they're go, like gonna go on an adventure or whatever like i was just really cool and i love that and uh, they're on I, their they're on their uh simon spires day off or ferris bueller's day off kind of deal yeah 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 i i guess i get i mean are you so are we supposed to think that they're skipping school or is it supposed to be the weekend i think they are skipping school i think they okay. mentioned that it's too beautiful of a day to be in inside or something. okay yeah that makes sense that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. that's true um and the sixth place in the sixth place in georgia right well, it was shot in Atlanta, so I assume it. It's I assume it takes place in Atlanta, and also the author lives in Atlanta. I see. I didn't know what city. I was like, "What city is that? What skyline?" Because they showed the skyline. And uh, correct, correct me wrong. Do they mention? I'm sure they do. Book of plenty of times, but um, in the movie, do they directly mention being in Atlanta ever? Uh, no. I think it kind of. It's kind of. Um, it kind of takes place wherever you want it to be. But, but that but but at the end that's 
very much so Atlanta skyline, right? Oh, it is. Okay, very cool. Very so, so it takes place in Atlanta. Okay. Um, I don't yeah. know which I don't know which side they live in, but yeah, it takes place <laughs> in Atlanta. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I see. I, I was actually thinking about that the whole movie. I was like, did I just miss where this takes place? I. I just look for that, like things like that sometimes. And they did, I don't think they did. Maybe it was on lice. I'm sure it's on lice. Obviously it has to be on license plates, but I didn't really pay attention to that. Um, but yeah. Um, also, I really like the setting of the, uh, of the um, fair. Yeah. I, I love that type of like setting and aesthetic in high school and like at night and the lights and all that. That was a cool end to the film. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a really nice. It's a little too sentimental, but ah uh, no, I, I love can't. that stuff. I love that stuff. <laughs> I kind mean, of, I kind of just have to let you know. But you're so far into the movie, you're so yeah. with it that you just let it go. Yeah. You just let it go. That's what I like about it. You just have to let it go. Well, I mean, you either get that or like some like boring thing. Like that's what I that's what I argue. It's like oh, it's like cliche or like too sentimental, like you said. But it's like. I mean, what do you want them to just be like randomly at like a party again, or like we already did that, or randomly at like the movie? Like you know, it'd be or at way, the park. Less, way more boring of a setting. Like you got to do something big and grand like that. Yeah, uh, or like yeah, like or at the park where like on a bridge, like in Central Park or something. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, it, I mean, it's it's the big dramatic payoff, and yeah. You know, it just works. It works completely. You're with the emotion of it all the way through. So it's a movie. Ooh. That's that's the best way to – it's a movie. It's a, it's a good one. It's a great, great one. Great one, great one, yeah. No, I love it. It's great. Um, but, yeah. I – but, yeah, and, and, and Martin as a character, they, they, they really toe the balance because they want to, to ba- – they want to kind of deconstruct that character – but they don't want to also be like, they don't want to be, they don't, I don't, I'm trying to think of the word. They don't want to like completely tell people that good people are bad or they don't want to, they don't want to come. They don't want to be, they want to make Martin interesting. Right. So it's a very, it's a very tricky balance because the movie does have its moments where they, you sort of are with martin but then you're but then there's the underlying subtext of he's still blackmailing simon right (laughs) no yeah he's he's yeah he's being a jerk um yeah and here's here's uh, like speaking of, of 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 like his friend characters um here's something i don't know if you picked this up it was a little uh confusing because i and I, I kind of liked it because, you know, there, there are multiple storylines of, like, you don't know who, like, obviously you didn't know who Blue was. And then you also, because you had Leah who had a crush on someone, and, you know, we find out that that's Simon. But you don't know for certain that it is because, you know, she doesn't straight up say it. But, I mean, I definitely understood that ma- that they were hinting at that being a possibility. But, I st- you know, at first he thought it was Nick, and he um, tried to hook them up together. But um, I... I see. I didn't think it was Nick. I never thought it was Nick. I knew she wasn't into that, but based off of uh, like her facial reactions to when he set them up. Um, but who I I actually thought it was Abby who she was into. I thought they're gonna have have Leah and Nick both into Abby because. Okay, so you know when Abby walks into the Halloween like walk walks into the backyard when they're all dressed up as Wonder Woman. And everyone gawks at her. Yeah, and Leah, she looks at her after after um, Abby and Nick. They're like, you know, like really connecting with each other's costumes. And Leah sees them connecting. She's like, "Uh, I'm gonna go inside." I was like, "Oh, okay." So so Leah has a crush on Abby, and. Uh, and then it ended up being kind of being Simon. And I was like, oh, I mean, of course that makes sense because of all the one-on-one stuff that kind of hinted at that when she like was spending a night and all that stuff. But I don't know. I, I, when I saw that scene, I was like, oh, she's jealous of Abby and Nick's connection. So I, was I the only one who thought that? Or? I didn't pick that up. But, okay. um, and I didn't really pick up that she was in love with Simon either. 
until I rewatched the movie. And then I started, and then after that scene, like it's very, very clear that she is talking about Simon because not only, you know, is the dialogue kind of directed at Simon, but if you look very closely, the, you know, the movie, the scene focuses in on, uh, literally or figuratively focuses, or literally focuses in on Leah as mm-hmm. she's like waiting for a response from Simon after she says all, cu- says all this like you know heart to heart stuff. Like if you look very closely, it's the the scene has a lot of emphasis on her reaction. Right, right. We'll see. Like once we get to that point, that's where I start to become like, oh uh, wait. Okay, because up to that point, I was like, oh, she has a crush on Abby. But that comes after, because that's obviously after the party when she spends the night. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. okay. Uh, wait, so then I'm like up in the air. I'm like, wait, which one is it? Or is it both? Or is it neither? I mean, like, I'm really like confused, but like in a good way. I, I like mm-hmm. how they had me guessing a little bit. Yeah, it's a it's a really good moment. Like that's that's one of my favorite scenes that, I think that I did not cry at. I'll say that it's one of the best scenes that I did not cry at <laughs> uh, because, because it's, it's really well written and you really, and it's well directed, especially if you know, if you're seeing it for the second or third time and you know uh, what Abby is trying to do, what Abby was trying to do in that scene, you just, you feel her emotion and you feel what she's, you feel what's going through her head, head in that moment. Mm. Uh, so it's a really good scene. It's a really good moment. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I do like the movie is that I fall in love with the characters and everything that's happening in the movie, in, um, in, in, in each scene. I love what each character is going through. And yeah. see that, and see, that's always the most important thing for me. And it always will be, um, you know, as a writer, for me, it's always character first, character first, character first, um, and not not only for like what I work on, but also what I both what like what I like, like what I'm a, attract, like become attached mm-hmm. to, or what attracts me uh, in storytelling uh, is the characters. That everything else always comes second, and uh, for me, just personally, mm-hmm. um, and. That's uh, very much so like a prominent thing here. It's the characters first and everything else is second. Um, and it's just handled really well. Yeah. It's a, just a really well done, really well made movie. And mm-hmm. I cannot, I can't stop recommending it. I, it, it I'm going to see it one more time before it leaves theaters and, and see it. And it's still shocking to me that this love Simon is about the same length as a wrinkle of time and after a wrinkle of time i still don't know what the characters want or their desires or why uh levi miller was there <laughs> did you see wrinkle of time yet I, I i have not seen it yet okay and and i actually like wrinkle of time just it's just i still have it still has character development issues Gotcha. you know i'm planning on seeing it sometime in the next week or so i gotta mm-hmm. i still have to see that I still have to see Tomb Raider, um, so I have to see both of those. But I, I'm I'm, I'm going to see Pacific Rim Uprising tonight. Um, but I'm going to see those some at some point in the next week. Uh, and, um, I, and and then also a really funny. I think I told you about this um, when I was texting you. But uh, I, I saw the movie with my friend, and she um, <laughs> she was like reacting to everything like and like telling me certain things and it was so funny um <laughs> like uh she was like all over the place with like you know who who was gonna be like who blue was and when it ended up being bram um and when they kissed on the ferris wheel and you know what like most like when it got revealed and they were talking and and all that she she actually screamed like in the theater, she screamed, and I was just laughing so hard. I mean, there are other, there are other people who like cheered and whatnot um, at certain points, but she like screamed. She was like, "Ah!" 
<laughs> and she loved she just was loving it so much and i was i was too but she was uh audibly loving it it was so great she's awesome it's really good well the the reason and when i saw the twist you know first because for a split second they trick us into thinking martin is blue oh my god which, which like i would have hated that I, I was the movies qual the movies you know quality would have went down for me. That would been like awful. <laughs> that would have been so bad. Like I thought they were gonna be like they'd be like he was just like a, he was and he it, like just been a troll the whole time. Like <gasps> no, I knew that wasn't gonna be the case. Like I was pretty sure it was Bram the whole time. Yeah, it was. It. I, I mean, I went along with the movie, so I didn't really was I wasn't really like guessing who the character was or who right. Blue was, but still, I when I saw it, it was like that is a moment that is a you know it was a sweet and surprising moment. And both times I've seen the movie, people were a gasp, people yeah. were surprised, right? And it, it it works. And and then of course people tear up or clap when especially me they when blue or when bram asks are you disappointed it's me and uh, simon's like no yeah definitely not that was like the first i mean they they even showed him like crushing on him when they were at, outside in the courtyard like eating lunch and whatnot planning the yeah. party like yeah definitely not he was more than more than happy that it was him yeah it's a great moment uh great moment and the movie bookends with an, an incredible moment uh another incredible moment so yeah uh do we have any more things to say on love simon before we move on uh no just be besides um just keep you know tell your friends to go see it because like i literally don't know one person that has seen this movie that uh hasn't liked it um one of one of my friends uh i, I told her to go see it she finally went to go see it yesterday and she was just overjoyed with how much she liked it and um i saw it like i said i saw it with my friend and she brought a couple more of her friends and everyone just loves loves it loves it it's, it's such such a great film and um yeah just and if for some reason you're you know you're listening to this and you haven't seen it yet you're like one of those people who listens to podcasts about films that before you go watch it um go see it you person listening go see, well, go go see the movie oh uh, yeah you, it's oh great. yeah mm-hmm. but yeah it's yeah i haven't even talked to anyone that hasn't seen or hasn't like hated it yet they haven't no one's well, hated yeah, the there's movie nothing yet. to hate about it yeah, it's just great it's, I mean, yeah everyone lo- i mean everyone loves it it's just amazing it's a good movie and i'm glad it exists yes so happy um all right, so we're going to move back to Matt. Mike, before we let you go, where can the good people find you? Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter over at Mike the Film Guy. Great. We'll be back in just a second. And we're back. So, Matt, very quickly, what were the screenplay machinations that you didn't that you didn't like in Love Simon? Oh, well, the fact that it was one reason is that it was a typical coming out narrative, and also the the ending, which near which while sweet still nearly drove me off. Can you can you elaborate more? Because I'm I'm trying to just figure out like what were what 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 did ring false personally? Because because uh, for me, what rang false to me was was that you know the things that rang false to me were minor in that. You know, in that Simon mentions that his parents are ostensibly liberal, but we know that the people that's, I mean, everyone struggles with coming out, but the, but the people that struck, but maybe I'm wrong to say this, but the people that struggle probably struggle the most of coming out are par- people with parents of, of, con- that are conservative. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
and 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 so I so I mean even I've seen the movie twice now and both times it's mentioned I'm like Simon you do have a leg up you know you do kind of have a I mean it's scary to come out no matter what but but it's still you know you kind of have a little bit of a leg up uh, and also a another one thing about the ending that nearly drove me off is that the uh, is the Ferris wheel where he just keeps Simon just keeps waiting and waiting for his crush to show up. They they didn't really he didn't really need the crowd the crowd of his classmates cheering him on. Oh yeah, that was. But they didn't yeah, really that need was, that. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's the. I mean, I get the intent behind it, but it is a little bit like no one. If if someone had had come out, they probably wouldn't want a crowd of people cheering them on, waiting for their crush. Oh, I I definitely wouldn't. Yeah, it's a little because that's not. It's just not the right moment. But the film itself, I I think the film was trying to work find kind of lock drove itself to a corner and didn't know how to get out because, you know, of course, big dramatic moments pay off. And of course, of course, Love, Simon is one of those movies where people kind of expect a big dramatic moment, but really the dramatic moment in that moment, it's not people cheering him on, you know, it's that Blue shows up. Yeah. That's the big dramatic payoff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this, I don't, I didn't, I don't, so going to spoilers, we already mentioned Martin, which Martin for me is like the movies, he is the movie's antagonist in that he's, in that he's the one that's basically, basically destroy, or the movie's villain, I should say, antagonist can mean something different things but he's the movie's villain because he's the one that's you know just not only blackmailing simon but he's destroying the lives of his friends in the process of him getting what he wants and and on top of that he is possessive very possessive of um abby yeah and that and i think the movie like I said, it plays to that balance because the movie has scenes like the Waffle House scene where he, you know, makes her scream that she's a hero or a warrior. And then you have, and and then the movie kind of realistically depicts what, like what an actual like big dramatic moment of like, like, you know how, um, what's that movie with Heath Ledger and uh, Julia Stiles? 10 Things I Hate About You. Yeah, a moment, it depicts like what a moment like that would be like in actual reality, which is, you know, which is, you know, it's in theory, in from a, in theory, it's supposed to be like this heartwarming moment, but, but poor Martin, he doesn't get it. (laughs) He doesn't, Abby's not into, Abby's not into Martin. Poor, and, but, and that's kind of the, and that's the thing. He just is not. He's not get. He's not. So, what did you, what did you think about the reveal, Matt, in the movie? Oh, well, I was surprised, yet I sort of saw it coming, because of how uh the uh, of how uh, Simon catches Bram trying to hook up with the girl that just had. That I I had immediately thought that maybe he wasn't blue, but then when it was revealed that he that it that he actually was blue, I was I was like, yeah, I sort of saw it coming just because of the way that the way that Bram looks at him just had me like, ah, uh, maybe. Well, it's very interesting because the party scene itself, you know, is like they get really flirty, they get really close without like. I mean, they get real. They get, they bond over the beer pong and 
a couple in the Oreos and they kind of, they start kind of having a bond. And then of course, when it is, when Simon catches him with a, a girl, it does like immediately like closes it, closes it in his mind. It closes it out of his mind. And it is a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit of a red herring, but maybe not like it's what's the word I'm looking for? It's not red herring. It's, um, uh, it's like a switcheroo or not. I'm thinking of what? Uh, I was, I was going to say, uh, MacGuffin, but that's not the right word. Because <laughs> because a, a MacGuffin is a. It's an object that the protagonist is looking for. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, um, I mean, it's a it, it throws the audience off a little bit, <clears throat> and we think for a while it is uh, the guy. It's the waiter at the Waffle House. Uh, and it's just, and but then you know he's attracted to Abby, and and it's just you know the way for me the way I kind of look at the the whole like how Blue was handled or how the reveal was done, the way I kind of look at it is is that uh, I kind of just go along with the movie and see where it goes, right? Because. I, I kind of just want to see like how it handles itself. And for me, I just thought, you know, it's fine if we get the Waffle House person or we get, um, is the other, we get, you know, Cal or it, it doesn't really matter per se. Like, but the film still works. It, and the film still works in when and when it is revealed that it is Bram, it's a moment where it's like it's a very sweet moment. It's a very because you know, Bram asks him, Are you disappointed? And Simon says, No. Oh, of I'm not, not disappointed. It's a very it's you know, it's still like that's kind of the whole idea of the movie. It's just really trying to be sweet and cuddly and heartwarming and inspiring to inspiring to everyone right and that's really the antithesis antithesis of the film is that it wants to inspire people it wants you to feel great i mean the movie ends with basically simon and his friends going on uh ferris bueller's day off kind of journey (laughs) yeah yeah, if they did a sequel, sign me up. Yeah, Simon Spires Day Off. Uh, and speaking um, of which, I, I we didn't mention on we talked about you know Tony Hale and Jennifer Garner, but not Simon Spear himself, Nick Robinson, oh, the man of the the man of the hour. He was. I, he was. I think he really lived de- demonstrated his star potential here because I, I saw I've seen him in films like Everything Everything and Jurassic World where he was solid but here he really gets to show off what he's made of he does and well he's given a role that works for him it works and and also it helps that he's you know he has material he's working with good material here oh, absolutely I and he's surrounded by a good cast. It's the way the way I look at it, because I agree, Nick Robinson really hasn't stood out to me in a movie since The Kings of Summer, which was his breakout role. Which and I haven't seen. It's a good movie. Really good movie. I know it's Directed the movie by that the helped. guy who did... I was going to say. Yeah, he, he, he does a movie about an... He does the very ups... The very obscure Kings of Scum, Kings of Summer, and he gets asked, "Want to do Kong Skull Island?" Want to do that, Jordan Voight Roberts? Uh, 
<sighs> well, but <laughs> but the thing I so watching this, it's like he really does give a powerful performance. I mean, and he's carrying a lot of the movie, and he carries the weight of the performance. And what that character should be very well. He carries it in strides. It's a, it, and it's just he he just emulates Simon very well and emulates you know the 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 feeling of it and the he emulates the character that he's given to play very well. Yep. Absolutely. But I just love. But I. But, you know, I not only do I like Nick Robinson in this movie, I just like the supporting cast. And, um, and, and they just do a really good job. It, you just, you know, they're, and not only do they do, the actors do a really good job, they're given interesting characters. They're given an interesting character, interesting characters. They all have, you know, problems, or they all have, you know, problems or little, little, little conflicts that they, they're trying to reach, like, uh, his friend, come on, why can't I remember any of these people's names? Uh, his friend, uh, um, Jonathan, not Jonathan, Nick. Oh, Nick, Nick, right? Nick, his friend Nick wants Abby, but you know, of course, you know, when he's you know, professes this to Nick to uh, Simon, he's basically being blackmailed by uh, Martin at the time, so he's trying to. You know, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to, like, you know, get him, get him away. And it, it, but you feel that you feel his attraction, like you feel his attraction towards Abby. And, and then, of course, you know, Leah has an interesting character because she's the one that really is in love. She's the one that's been in love with Simon since. She's the char- She's the kind of character that's been in love with someone their whole childhood, and oh, yeah. for her, realistically, it's devastating to hear that. It's a little devastating to hear that you know his that he's gay. It's devastating because you know she had this whole idea that maybe one day you know sh- he'll see her for what he'll he'll be attracted to to her, and it's a very you know honest moment it's a very honest moment of like where you know these where she's having a heart to heart about like her feelings and you know now she's ha- and now she's confronting the reality in a really salt in a really okay way but it's in an honest way like she she you know isn't she's not like suppressing it she's you know letting her feelings you know her her feelings out and it's a and that's just a really interesting way to go. And you see that, and you see those little hints throughout the movie that she is in love with Simon. Yeah. Um, which, you ready to talk about the soundtrack? Yep. So, so Matt, what was your favorite, what was your so- favorite song of Love, Simon? Probably strawberries and cigarettes, just because choice of Anne. It is a great song, and I've been, I've been hearing a, hearing it for like the last week, and it's a really good song. But I kind of love the song that plays when Abby and Simon are talking, like after they get home f- from the party. There's a song. There's a little song from. Uh, Amy, Amy Smart, I think, or not Amy Smart. Uh, let me. Oh, um. Uh, Amy, Amy Shark. Amy Seekin. Shark. Uh, Seekin that, oh know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And her little song that plays in the middle of Simon and um, Leah's, you know, little little scene where she's, you know, asking him, "Do you?" Have you ever loved someone so much that it nearly kills you to think about it, or do you think, or you think it's going to kill you? And it's just a really good, honest moment, and it play and it works so well in the scene because it's from her point of view. Like, and yes, we do 
shift in the scene, you know, from Simon to Leah, but the the scene is prominently Leah's. Right. And it's very, and it's very interesting that, you know, the biggest signifier of it is oh is that, you know, most of the movie has a lot of male artists doing the songs, and this is the one song in the movie that's very that's from the female perspective. And and it's and there's a female song in it and and it and it ha- and the lyrics do have a relevance. So it's and that's why I kind really like the soundtrack because the songs work accompany very well into you know into the movie. Going back to Strawberries and Cigarettes, the moment that Simon find, figures out that or thinks he figured out who Blue is in Lyle, the Waffle House guy. It's a very, you know, the song Strawberry and Cigarettes play, and it's a song that it's like there's like a welcoming like humbleness of okay, I might have figured this out. Oh yeah. Oh, so that and, that's the scene where the song played. Mm-hmm. Uh. It, it's very subtle. It's very, very subtly in there, but uh, it's in it's in. Oh, I think uh, it's starting to come back to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then of course, and then of course, you know, Bleachers from Wild Heart bookends oh, I... the movie. Oh yeah, I love that song. It's very it's very eighties, isn't it? It is. It. And that's like, and that's really Rob Simonson's kind of score. Is it? It kind of re, it's reminiscent of, you know, eighty soundtracks. Yeah. You know, it kind of. I guess the kind of you know, ele, you know, have the feel of that this is a John Hughes kind of story. Yeah. In a way, but yeah, I really. But for me, the soundtrack works very well in that it works in that we are with we're with um it it works it accompanies the scenes very well that in the mood that's you know happening along with rob simon's rob simon's score right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so What else do we have to say about Love, Simon? That it's brilliant. It's a br- it is. Yep. I, I, even though it, it's all unfortunate it took this long for something like this to get made, it was certainly worth the wait. It is, and, you know, it's... It's just... It it is it is in its own way. I mean, I understand. Not I understand that not every facet of the LGBTQ community got representation in this movie, but I think if a movie like Love Simon does get made, it will kind of send a ripple wave of other, and will and hopefully will come other movies like this. Because you, I just, I think it's just hard to not. I think it's just hard not to, you know, to understate like how important it is. Oh yeah. And you know, and and Fox is kind of, go, and Fox is kind of, you know, in a similar boat like Paramount in that they're not doing too hot this year. All, almost all their films that have come out this year have bombed or not made an, a lot of money. But I admire so much of, you know, Fox for taking this leap of kind of this leap of faith and just putting it out there, seeing what happens. And yeah. it didn't cost that much to make. Yeah. And even though they took a leap of faith, it still got beat up by a Christian movie. I can only imagine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I I know I just wanted to I just wanted to be punny. 
You're so funny, Matt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, here's here's but, hoping it has a strong. I hope it has. I really hope it has a strong hold. Uh, I, I really hope, hope it does it too, because hold. well, cinema score shouldn't always be taken as an indicator of a, what makes a good movie. Clearly, since Mother got an F on cinema score. Yeah, well, there's there, like the great Sarah Michelle Gellar one. So maybe in oh, there's there's no accounting for taste. What? I said like the great Sarah Michelle Gellar once said in Scream 2. Well, there's no accounting for taste. Yeah. So I so I mean I just, you know, I well, the thing what I was going to say about Cinema Score is is that it it has an A+. Love Simon has an A+ on Cinema Score. Yeah. And usually that's a good indicator that word of mouth is strong and I saw this movie. I had not to, not to, not to rub it in anyone's face, but I did get to see the movie early, and the screening I went to, like, fell in love with the movie. Like, th- everyone fell in love with it, and not only did they fell- fall in love with, they, the author was there, and she, you know, could, she was there really just to present the movie. And then she kind of stayed afterwards to answer some questions. And um, and afterwards, uh, everyone just got in a single file. A lot, most of the audience got in a single file line and just hugged her and thanked her for for this movie, even though even though it even though it technically was Greg Berlanti that directed the movie. You know, people were still thanking her and thanking the thanking her for getting this kind of story out there, and it was just a beautiful sign of humanity. And even after I saw it the second time, which did not have a full crowd, people were still clapping and cheering. Like it's a it's a rip roaring movie. I don't know what your experience. What was your experience when you saw the movie? Oh, well, the crowd seemed to really like it. It wasn't a full house, but there were people laughed, and they even there were even some some claps by the time it was over. Yeah, I think the movie brilliantly put uh, Wild at Heart at the pot at the end of the movie because it just leaves you on such a happy note. Oh, absolutely! And it just accompanies and it accompanies the images you're seeing in the movie because it, like I said at the end of my review, the movie ends with basically diversity or most of diversity in a car. Like it ends, like it ends with a gay white person, a straight white woman, a interracial an interracial teen, a black a black female, and and uh, a black Jewish kid, black Jewish gay, gay teen. Exactly, and they they don't make a huge fuss over it. Yeah, they, in fact, most of the scene is most of that final moment is silent. They're just in the car, and they're getting ready to, and they're just getting and they're just going to take the day off because it's such a beautiful day. They're going to go off and have their Ferris Bueller day off in Atlanta. Yep. Yes, so, they are. It is. Hence, we want that sequel. <laughs> Just give it to us. Just give it to us. We don't care. We'll we'll see it. We'll compromise. We'll see it on Netflix. <laughs> any 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 way, shape, or form. Any shape or form. We'll we'll see I mean, it call- on our cell phones. Yeah, I mean, Call Me By Your Name is getting a sequel. I'm sure Love, Simon can get one, too. Yeah, and that movie really underperformed when you think about, like, how it should have had, how it should have, you know, been bigger. Well, that's because, that's because Sony Pictures Classic, they, they, they're, they strategized it like a damn tortoise race, where it took, like, two months for it to play wide. And in in the day 
as I told you before, in this day and age of streaming and piracy, they just can't go release a film that damn slow anymore. You can't. I mean, especially if you're trying to get Oscar buzz. Right, and I think one reason that it got it got such few nom they got few nominations is because of its poor box office showing. Mm-hmm. And I think it is safe to say that I'm I'm very happy that I'm very happy that Luca Guadagnino's next movie is with Amazon. Yep. Um, because, uh, Spiria, it's a big, you know, it's a big, you know, class, it's a remake of a classic Italian horror film and it, and it has a, pretty much an all-star, all A-list cast and to see, you know, Sony and to see like some, a company like Sony Pictures Classics do the same thing with Calling By Your Name, it's a little bit like, it would it would not work. And I think they, and I think they botched it when the movie got nominated and they did not do an expansion of, on the movie. Right. I think they banked too heavily on Oscar nominations, if I'm being totally honest. Yeah. Oh, well, at least Luca Guadagnino is still working. That's what matters. And we're still getting the sequel. And this, we and will. this, and in this upcoming award season, we're probably going to get more Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer. Yep. Everything worked out. We just wish that Call Me by Your Name did better. Yeah. So, do we have anything more to say with Love Simon? Because I, because the thing is, I did a react video, and I did already, you know, the SoCal video or SoCal Thrills review um, a couple weeks ago. So is there any more to say on it other than please go see it? Uh, Not really. All right. Well, Matt, I, where can, on that note, where can the good people find you? You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at FilmGuy619. Then you can also follow my work on Filmotomy, Film Inquiry, Cinema Centuries, Guy Essential, and Culture Vultures. I'm basically slowly taking over the internet. It's slowly but surely, much like uh, much like the Queen in Game of Thrones. Yep. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure, and we will and we will see you next time. Uh, before, well, wait, hold on, just a second. Okay. On that, well, on that note, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Movie Kale, and you can also follow the podcast at the Youth Critic, and then you can also, also. Follow the channel that distributes this podcast at KG Network. I'll have a link in the description to my Love Simon review, and I'll also have links to all of the to basically where you can find all of Matt's work. Because actually, Matt has organized on his Twitter where you can find all of his work. Yep, and it's really good. I'll leave the link in the description below. Thanks, everyone. We will be back with you soon. Uh, we have uh, we have the Thoroughbreds review coming out, uh, or or probably have already come out, and then we'll have um, another review of A Wrinkle in Time coming out soon, and then eventually we'll get kind of back in the order of things. Um, I've been very busy on my front. I'm like six weeks away from graduating college, so the podcasts are coming as soon as they can, <laughs> as soon as I can make them. Um, but Matt, thank you again. I, it, it means a lot to me that you, it means a lot to me that you were on this podcast. It really does. Oh, it's no problem. Thank you. And see you guys. Bye. Nobody knows I'm gay. <sighs> Have you seen the new post about the closet, a gay kid at school? What? 
Who do you think it is? Can I call you back? Dear Blue, I'm just like you. <sighs> this was a mistake. It's nice to know there's another guy at school with the same secret. When did you first realize? It was a bunch of little things, like my first girlfriend. I think I'm falling in love with you. Wow, thank you. Be right back. Wasn't my proudest moment. Sometimes I think I'm destined to care so much about one person, it nearly kills me. Me too. I'm done living in a world where I don't get to be who I am. I deserve a great love story. And I want someone to share it with. Have you ever been in love? I think so. These last few years, it's almost like I can feel you holding your breath. 